Hi, and welcome to the IT Chronicles, coming to you from the Gartner Data Centre Conference in Las Vegas. I'm Kirsty McGowan, and I'm here with Charlie Betts. Kirsty. And we have great pleasure in chatting with King Gonzalez. And hi, it's nice to see you. Wonderful to have you back again. Now, usually you're, you're sitting on this side of the, uh, of the equation asking the questions, but you've had some big changes recently. Do you want to t tell us what's been going on for you? Absolutely. So uh, I'm now a research director at Gartner and I'm focusing on IT service management. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a bit strange being on <laughs> this side of the chair, but yeah. I like it. I, I'm really enjoying my time there. I get to work with excellent people, talk about interesting stuff, write things that are mm -hmm. leading edge, and deal with customers that are absolutely a joy. So mm -hmm. I, I could not ask for a better situation. <laughs> well, congratulations, and Thank Gartner you. is very yeah. fortunate. Uh, you've mentioned your first two projects, or your first two uh, lines of inquiry have been around major incident management and also uh, service desk consolidation. What's going on in the world of major incident management nowadays? Well, so in major incident management, one of the things I've been talking to is the fact that what we have is a continuity continuum, starting everything from business continuity, flowing down into IT service continuity, uh, IT disaster recovery, and then down into major incident management. Somewhere about the middle, we end up dropping off all of the things that we learn about how to manage large-scale incidents and mm -hmm. ensure we have a proper method of responding mm -hmm. so that we're able to deal with the effects and get the business back upright in a very short order. But when it comes to major incident management, the predominant way of doing things is organized around, let's open a bridge and invite everybody to jump on. It yep. does not have the planning discipline or the ability to let people that are doing the response actually focus on what they need to do to resolve it and get things back up and running. So my first piece of research is this specifically designed to help them understand how to take those techniques and use them to organize their major incident response efforts. Yeah, well, that's it. maybe that's actually really interesting because I think it's something that, I mean, every organization knows they need to be doing it well and yeah. they think they understand how they're supposed to be doing it, but it does, it gets lost in the weeds somewhere. So, you know, what are your sort of, um, what's your advice? How, well, where do people start? The, the first thing is you have to be clear about the roles in incident response. And I define something called an incident coordinator. So an incident coordinator is the person that's responsible, like the quarterback mm -hmm. for the incident. Yeah. Right. So they have to manage the communications internally as well as externally. And I've also separated that out from the role of the incident owner. So in a lot of cases, uh, an incident coordinator and an incident owner, they may be dual hatted. So they may actually be one person. Uh, but in certain cases, they actually may be a different person. So the incident owner has the ability to make decisions on behalf of the organization. Right. Are we going to take something yeah. down? Do we need to reboot something? Right. Uh, and in certain cases, they actually need to go back to the executive team and get permission to do these things because of right. potential yeah. impacts in other areas. Because it may not be about the particular disruption that they're handling at the moment. So we want to bring some discipline to that. And also, with span of control issues, uh, when you have people on your response team, hmm, you want to be able to give them the freedom to work on the things that they work on. So they might actually have a team leader that they report to that helps facilitate the communication yep. and also help prioritize the work so that everybody that's on the team is moving towards a resolution and they know what their part is, they know how to do it, they actually can bring all of their attention. And when we do that, we actually get close rates that are a lot higher, they're much more effective, and they're actually shorter in duration. So this is a situation where communication actually enables things to move yep. quicker, not slower. Yes. These are such critical situations, and it's so important to handle them correctly. I think we've seen a lot of very interesting insight coming out of the web scale community on this. Uh, companies, you know, obviously like Google with their site reliability engineers, and uh, as we were talking, I mentioned John Alspa, who I yeah. always like to give a shout out to for really pioneering some of the thought leadership in here and bringing in some of what we know as a society about how to handle these things, not necessarily in IT, but in domains such as aviation and so on. So you're really doing some great work with, uh, with uh, you know, furthering the cause on, on this thing, because these things really cost money and can be life impacting for people even.
Right. Um, so on to the other major mm -hmm. theme that you've been exploring is the, uh, the consolidation of service desks. Uh, certainly when, you, we when we bring companies together and we bring support staffs together, that's not a simple proposition. No, it's not. And I actually refer to it in the larger sense as either uh, service desk transformation or service desk migration. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, a particular place where each organization is at today, their current state. And there's probably a number of different use cases that go along with whatever a defined future state is. That could be a consolidation. Uh, that could be part of a merger and acquisition where you're bringing in an entirely new team and you're not sure how to make them fit together. And the INO leaders that I've been talking with have been asking questions about, we know that we have to do it, but we're not exactly sure what we should do or the things that go into the planning considerations to help make sure that we don't experience quality or service issues as we do the consolidation. So it should just appear, appear as something which is the user never ends up seeing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's as if it happened by magic. <laughs> right, right. And there's a reliable mm -hmm. set of steps that we need to go through and a number of different planning factors and considerations that go into what we should be focusing our attention on. So that by the time you get to the point where you're starting to do the actual mechanics of doing the migration, it should be like following a plan. Mm -hmm. Got it. So obviously the uh, the cultural change side of that's a big a big part of the of the consolidation, making sure that everyone's on board. Absolutely, the, communication yeah. is a and it, it's thematic, right, with yep. the major incident mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the, the thing I believe is that we can never go wrong by really deepening the level of communication and relationship that we have in our various teams, um, because if we do that, we're giving people an opportunity to kind of reset how they engage on a project from being like in it for, well, how does this impact me personally? Mm -hmm. no, let's actually yeah. change the tables and now start saying, I wanna see what part is mine to contribute as part of the transformation or migration exercise. So there's a new context in which people can actually operate. Yep. And in doing that, what we can help do is make sure that people are taking the actions that are not only good for them, but they're better for the organization and they're out to serve the customer. Excellent. Yeah, I think what, I, what I've noticed too, when, when people start talking about consolidating service desks and bringing, bringing different teams together, they immediately start thinking about the product. But the product is probably one of the lesser concerns when you're doing this, isn't it? It's Absolutely. Uh, you can actually take practically any product you yep. want and continue to use it as long as it's not gonna fall over because it's not being maintained yep. mm -hmm. or it's not a, an ongoing support burden where mm -hmm. the vendor no longer supports it so yep. you need to get off the platform. But if you have a functioning platform, the more important consideration is how do you address the key objectives by which your organization is gonna be managed mm -hmm. in the future and ensure that you're taking the appropriate actions to fulfill those. Yep. So that's that an essential part of the migration context that needs to be preserved and acted upon. Yeah, great. Well, Ken, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you again, and I hope we get the opportunity for a few more conversations. I'm certainly looking forward to it. Thank right. you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Bye.